any of the great die-offs be uh, an indicator of when these? Well, I would I would think that would be one die-off at 560 million years ago, one at 400. Twenty one to two hundred and ninety. Well, the problem with that is, is that the a meteor stream doesn't its lifespan is not that long. A meteor stream, the lifespan of a meteor stream might be say five thousand to twenty thousand years, maybe a little longer depending on the size and mass of the progenitor comet that created it. Like obviously, the Torrid system was spawned by a huge comet. Because there's no other meteor stream that has as many um, subfamilies within it and, and associated things. There's, there's actually two comets associated with that, fa with that system. There's um, at least several large asteroids that are associated with that system. And then if, there's actually several sub-meteor streams that are associated with the Torrid system. So it's it's the it's the biggest most complex meteor stream that our earth our pla planet passes through i think most of the estimates as to the age of that torrid meteor stream are perhaps 20 to 25,000 years old and in fact i think that a possible a, a, an interesting um, scenario to explore would be that the onset the last great global cooling that brought on the last substage of the last ice age, the Wisconsin Ice Age, which occurred about 26,000 years ago, may have been triggered by the arrival of the parent comet of the Torrid meteor shower that doesn't exist anymore because it's fragmented and produced all of these streams and substreams and asteroids and other cometary bodies that were originally part of one big object. Well, what I'm saying is couldn't, couldn't the initial, the initial of a situation be be from one big meteor hitting or moving into the area of the Earth. Wouldn't a, we'll say the we'll say the die off of two hundred ninety thousand million years ago, which was almost massive, about ninety eight percent left. The Permian. Right. Yeah. If that if would would that happen with an in with an in an income. Of one big meteor caused that die off? Well, it could, yeah. I, that's what I gave you that article about. It talks about that. Yeah, she actually gave me a very interesting article about that very period, about the volcanism, because there was right. enormous volcanic eruptions up in the area of Siberia. In fact, they even call it, it says here, um, this is an interesting connection. An ancient killer is hiding in the remote forests of Siberia. Walled off from Western eyes during the Soviet era and forgotten among the endless expanse of wilderness, scientists are starting to uncover the remnants of a super volcano that rained hell on earth 250 million years ago and killed 90% of all life. Researchers have known about the volcano, the Siberian traps, for years. And they've speculated that the volcanic rocks, which cover an area about the size of Alaska, played a role in runaway global warming that led to the end Permian mass extinction, the worst dying the planet has ever seen. Now a team of researchers led by Henrik Svensson of the University of Oslo in Norway have performed a series of experiments showing the volcano employed an arsenal of deadly weapons during its 200,000 year long assault on the biosphere. Um, so then it goes on, searing magmas from the volcano intruded into the Tunguska Basin in eastern Siberia, a region laden with thick deposits of coal, oil, and gas. Heat from the molten rock baked the hydrocarbons, turning the area into the world's largest fossil fuel burning plant. Now you notice they said the Tunguska Basin. See, I've thought for many years the possibility that the Siberian traps were similar to a basaltic outflowing on the moon, which is almost certainly brought on by that, an impact of an asteroid from space. So if you have an impact 250 million years ago and it causes a huge rupture in the crust of the earth and now you have this flowing out, it'd be just like if I came in and I you know, shot you with a nine millimeter and punctured a hole in you and now the blood is flowing out. That's the lava, that's the magma flowing out in pulse after pulse 
until finally it subsided after, like it said, about 200,000 years. And in fact, there's evidence that the Earth actually underwent multiple impact episodes around the end of the Permian. So I think that the volcanism is ultimately related to impacts. Because I think that the exogenic, the outside forces, are what are ultimately governing what goes on down here below, including the endogenic, which would be volcanic or seismic or anything that's coming from within the Earth. I mean, even though an impact relative to the size of the Earth may be small, it, what it is, it's if, I, if I took a, a 38 caliber bullet and threw it at you and hit you in the chest with it, it wouldn't do much to you. But if I shot it out of an end of a 38 revolver and it's moving at what? How fast they move? 5,000 miles an hour? A bullet? Maybe? 58, 50, 900, so, so, yeah, yeah, something like that. So if it was moving at that fast, it would be a whole di getting hit by that little piece of lead would be a much more serious and traumatic event and that's the same deal with the earth you know if you got something that's five miles or ten miles wide it's small compared to the earth but it could potentially be moving five or ten times faster than that bullet so that's gonna pack a hell of a punch when it hits and I think it's entirely possible that we've talked about the basalt outflowings up in Washington State, the Columbia basalt outcroppings, that ultimately resulted from, from the, um, the magma welling up in the region of, of Yellowstone Park, right? Why is Yellowstone Park so active geothermally? Well, it's got this active magmatic plume below it. Okay, how did that magmatic plume get there, that plume of magma coming up? It's very possible, and it has been proposed by some fairly well-respected geologist that the magma plume may have ultimately originated from an impact of a, of a fast-moving, dense object coming in perpendicular to the surface of the earth and punching a hole through the crust right down into the mantle. And this now allows the upwelling of the fluid magma flows out on the surface of the earth, creating a basalt plateau, whether it's the Columbia Basalt Plateau in Washington or the Deccan Traps in India, which coincidentally seem to have appeared at the same time as the great impacts that terminated the dinosaurs. Now we've got the Siberian Traps, the size of Alaska. So if there was a crater formed, if these things did result, the problem is, is that the impact site is now buried under thousands of feet of lava rock. So it's, it's hard to correlate it. But I'm, I will bet that at some point we'll ultimately find out that magma plumes are the result of these high, high velocity impacts of asteroids. Boom, hitting the earth, punching through the crust. Well, it eventually heals, but yeah, I mean, the Siberian traps now is healed. But see, now, now that brings up another interesting question, and you've probably forgotten this, so I'll remind you. But in the, in the presentations that I did on Tunguska, I showed that the explosion of Tunguska appears to be right over the vicinity that would be ground zero of the Siberian traps. In other words, it's possible. We've got a, 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 a weird coincidence here, right? Let's suppose that the Siberian Traps was caused by an impact, something punching through the crust. Okay, that center of that region where this outflowing was is called the Tunguska Basin. There's actually like a basin under the, the cap, the thousands of foot thick cap of, of lava rock, there's a basin. That basin could be the remnant of a great impact. At the epicenter of that basin lies directly below where the Tunguska event exploded, where the explosion took place. Now that could be just a coincidence, but it was that association that has led some Soviet scientists to actually speculate that the Tunguska event wasn't exogenic, something from outer space, it was actually something that was caused from within the Earth, that it was some kind of, some kind of a seismic event that caused a massive sudden ionization of the atmosphere. But in any case, we have this juxtaposition of the center of the Tunguska, ba Tunguska Basin and the site of the Tunguska explosion of 1908. It could be, and this is getting us into the, some of the theories of uh, chaos and chronicles by um, Herbert Shaw, the idea that impacts the, the geographic, there are susceptible, 
there are geographic zones that are susceptible to repeated impacts. In other words, shot, well, it's complicated. It's very, it's based totally on chaotic dynamics. And the delivery of things from space along the same trajectories and pathways. But that's not chaotic. That's normal. Well, it's what's, it's, it appears to be, yes, on one level it's organized, but you haven't studied chaos theory. Otherwise, you would know that the whole point of chaos theory is, is that, yes, on, on some higher level, there is an organization. And that's Shaw's theory, is that there are pathways, delivery, what? Attractors. Attractors, yes. And that there are certain pathways along which cosmic material is regularly, repeatedly delivered into the Earth vicinity. And this would fit Shaw's theory, actually. Because of, because of the densities in the crust, some, some places are more dense than others, and that tilts the, the uh, tendency for the land for the comet to come in and be attracted to those areas. What about magnetic you know, stuff on the ground and on the edge? Sure. I mean, there's, there's some very interesting possibilities here. What I've been considering all along, two things. To have a science of catastrophism, First of all, recognition that the ultimate driver of terrestrial catastrophes is extraterrestrial. Secondly, the idea, which, which, is, which is supported by a lot of scientific findings, certainly seems consistent with the ancient ideas, is that there is a regular, predictable tempo or rhythm to these events, to these great catastrophic events. Certain modern scientific research would seem to confirm that Yes, perhaps the timing of encounters between Earth and things from space is not random. There may be some sort of periodicity to it. And again, that seems to be confirmed because as we get more and more craters and impact scars on the surface of the Earth, it appears that they cluster. They're not spread uniformly through geological time. They cluster about certain nodes. There definitely seems to be periodicities within the geological record associated with these impacts. Now, if Shaw's theory is correct, then it's not just a matter of the timing that may have an element of predictability, it's also the, the, the geography of it, the cosmic geography of it. He's suggesting that, again, we can look for these co the arrival of the cosmic entities along certain specific repeatable pathways. Now, that could be extremely profound those two ideas, putting them together for a science of catastrophism in the future that would allow hu the human species to essentially understand, because right now we would be totally at the mercy of the next Tunguska. We have no idea when and or, or you know or where. Where would it occur? See, would, it have, would anything like this be uh, correlated on our on our path through space that we're certain? at certain points at certain times which we would be subject to a higher uh, chance? Well, I see that's exactly the lines along which I think we should be thinking. And here comes the, the, the connection, the Syrian connection. Because it seems like a lot of ancient traditions actually talk about the structure of our solar system and in all of the, the sacred geometry expressions of like the ancient the ancient sacred sites, the temples, what we find redundantly represented in those patterns is the geometry of the solar system over and over and over again. Okay, now we also find references to the, the processional cycle, which is a cycle, I believe, embedded within a greater cycle. Now, clearly, modern science has identified a greater cycle, which is a galactic year. But that's, 200, interestingly, about 250 million years. The rotation of, of the Milky Way galaxy is estimated to be about 250 million years, which means that it was about one galactic year ago when the greatest mass extinction, the, the greatest catastrophic event since life appeared on the Earth occurred at that Permian-Triassic that we were talking, I was just reading from here, when this tremendous volcanic eruptions and probable clustered multiple impact events. So already there seems to be an interesting connection going on there. We see one galactic year ago, the great, most traumatic event in the history of, of life on Earth, okay? Well, 
science recognizes and has acknowledged that there is a galactic cycle. Okay, now within and, and now we also know that there are cycles within the solar system, and we have talked about how the Kuiper disk delivers comets to Earth crossing orbits. And what is what is one at least one of the powerful triggers for bringing in that influx of comets? Who remembers? Who remembers? What was it that, that, that brought, that initially brought in those showers of, of extraterrestrial entities? It was alignments of the outer planets. You remember that, don't you, Jeremy? Right? The, the outer planets line up. Remember we talked about the bucket brigade and how the planets hand off the comets as they deliver them in? Well, there is a there is a synchronicity, a rhythm to those planetary alignments. And that rhythm, the orbits within the solar system, almost certainly are related to some greater orbital systems. Now, one of the teachings that I've encountered over the years is the teachings of Gurdjieff and some of his followers like Uspensky and Rodney Collin and uh, several others. Rodney Collin wrote a book called The Theory of Celestial Influence and he devoted a section in there to the idea that there were periodicities, we, you know, the wheels within wheels model. There are periodicities within or cycles within greater cycles and those cycles are embedded within greater cycles. Well, if you assume that the great year, what we refer to as the great year is this 26,000 year cycle and it's divided into four subsections all demarcated by when that X, that cosmic X, moves through those constellations. One every, on average, 6,480 years, forming one of the four stations of the, uh, the four limbs of the cross, the total being 26,000, half of it being 13,000, or to use the sacred number, 12,960. Now, is that embedded within a greater cycle? And there are teachings, well, of course, and science recognizes that, yes, we're then part of a galactic cycle. Ancient teachings seem to point to the idea of a sub-galactic cycle. In other words, a cycle or a period somewhere between the 26,000 years of the processional cycle and the 250 million years of the galactic cycle. And if there was, how would you locate and determine such a thing? Well, what you would do is you would look for a local star system of which our sun is a part. And when you begin to look for a local star system that looks like it could be organized into a type of a, a coherent rotational system, much on the model of our own solar system, do we find such a thing? And the answer is yes, we do. We do. We find that there is a local neighborhood of stars, say within 30 to 50 light years of groupings of stars, many of which are very prominent in the sky, that give the appearance, at least the impression initially, of possibly being organized into a coherent rotational system. Because they are all lying within roughly the same plane, just like the planets of our solar system lie within the plane of the ecliptic, which is a band 16 degrees wide in the sky eight degrees above that yellow line that we saw, eight degrees below. And within that zone, that belt, all of the planets make their circuits. All of them. Okay. Now, we go that we go to the local stellar neighborhood, and we're talking about stars like, like Sirius, Vega, and, and uh, probably eight or nine others. And they're all basically lying mostly in the same plane, and they're relatively close to each other. And how we would determine that is we would have to look at the star's proper motion. Now, when you, if you were to go out and we watch from day to day the sun against the backdrop of stars, the sun gives the illusion of moving, correctly? Correct? Yeah. Okay, but we know it's not the sun that's moving that, that gives, makes it appear to drift through the signs of the zodiac. What's actually moving? We, we're moving, right? It's our motion that makes it appear as if the sun is actually drifting through the constellations. Well, you've got to apply that same kind of thinking, that same model, but now we're applying it 
to an association, a, a grouping of stars. And when you do that, there is a star that, because of its proper motion, appears to be possibly close to a rotational center. And which star do you suppose that is? And, and yes, and I'm going to try, hopefully this software I've got will actually allow this to be animated. And that's what I'm hoping, because there would be no better way to see it than to show that the motion of Sirius turns out to be about one arc second per year. One arc second. That means that if we look at Sirius, relative, and Sirius is just a little over eight light years away. That's a very close star to us. If we look at Sirius against the backdrop of stars that are much further away, like 100 or 300 or 500 light years away, what we see is that Sirius is actually moving a little bit. It's moving against that backdrop of stars very similar to the way our sun is moving against the backdrop of stars. But due to the fact that one orbit, one revolution of the Earth around the sun takes 365 days, or roughly one degree per day, our motion around the sun is about one degree per day. Therefore, the sun appears to have moved one degree per day. Sirius appears to move one arc second per year. Well, if it turned out that Sirius was at the center or close to the center of a subgalactic rotational system, that motion of Sirius may actually be an indication of our motion relative to Sirius. Did you follow what I was trying to say? Yes. Now, I said one arc second per year. One arc second per year now is, is, is the, the measured proper motion of Sirius by astronomers and astrophysicists one arc second per year. So in a whole cycle, in a complete circle, how many arc seconds are there? No, that's 360 degrees. And a degree is divided into an arc minute, and an arc minute is divided into an arc second. Did you hear what he said? Well, he knows. He, Jeremy's been paying attention. See, he's been listening because we've been talking about this. Okay, so 1,296,000 arc seconds in a circle. Picture again, here's your circle. It's divided into 360 degrees. Each of those degrees is 60 minutes. So 60 times 360 is 21,600 arc minutes. But each one of those 21,600 arc minutes is further subdivided into 60 arc seconds. So 60 times 21,600 is where you get the, the number 1,296,000. 1,296,000 arc seconds. So if it's moving one arc second per year, then how many years in a full cycle? 1,296,000. Now how coincidental is it that when you turn to the ancient Vedas, when they're talking about the Yuga cycles, these vast sweeping cycles of time, that the Treta Yuga is given as precisely 1,296,000 years. See? I don't want to lose the track of all this explanation that I just went through. My point, my point is, I'm raising a new issue. We haven't really discussed this much in here, but I think it'll turn out to be a key factor within this grand, sacred, cosmological scheme, is that there is a subgalactic system that involves a local neighborhood of stars that could perhaps be in a coherent, rotating system, like a larger version of our own solar system, and if we look at the periodicities within that, we may find clues to the periodicities of the destabilization of the cometary masses that lie between the stars making up these systems. Because there may be stars, it may be the, just as the planets, the outer planets lining up can cause an influx of cosmic material to the sun. Start feeding that stuff like just in a, in a open, open the sluice gates and the stuff comes in. And what is it that does it? It's the, it's the enhanced gravitational fields of the outer planets as they line up. Yeah, Essentially, they gravitationally, they, they'll pull it right in. That's, that's a way you can think of it. That's right. Now, if we go to this next level that I'm describing, you see what we're happening is we're, we're bringing comets in from the Kuiper disk. Okay, but the Kuiper disk is being fed from the Oort cloud, which is this vast zone of trillions of comets that surrounds our own star and presumably all of the neighboring stars as well. Well, is it possible that 
as these stars shift in their orbits, their subgalactic orbits, that they are triggering cascades of comets from the Oort cloud to the Kuiper disk, replenishing the Kuiper disk. Now the outer planets are drawing in the comets and depleting the Kuiper disk. And that's one of the things that astronomers have noticed. But isn't the Oort cloud feeding the Kuiper disk? Right, so yes, yes. How can it be depleting it? Well, it's no, the planet's drawing off. There's a, there's, see, there's a, there's a leakage from the Kuiper disk to the inner solar system. That leakage is being triggered by the alignments of the outer planets. The outer planets line up and their combined gravitational fields will draw in the cometary material. So <clears throat> as that stuff leaks in to the sun, it'll ultimately, what happens now, let's think about this process. What happens once the comet is drawn out of its reservoir, its storage reservoir, where it's, where it's being stored in deep freeze, right? And now it's drawn in and it starts its inward journey towards the sun. As it comes in, if it, if it crosses the, it close to the orbits of the planets as it comes in, the planetary gravity, particularly of Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter especially, can cause, just like we saw in 1993-94 with Shoemaker-Levy 9, we saw one comet turn into 21 comets. That's what we saw with Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 93-94. We saw one giant comet get transformed into 21 comets, pieces, 21 pieces. But each of those was, in effect, its own comet after that, with its own nucleus, its own path in space. Okay. Well, now, if, if, the, if the planets are bringing those comets in, they now start traveling towards the sun, and they now become into this orbit within the sun. They go from a, a, a large orbit that's, that's halfway to the next star, right, that takes millions of years to complete. And now they're drawn in, and they come down, and they spiral down, and they'll usually get locked in a resonance between the sun and Jupiter. And now they go through this dance between the Sun and Jupiter. And as the geometry of their orbit evolves, they begin to break up and they produce multiple comets and cometary fragments and meteor streams. And then those meteor streams can now spawn streams of dust. And there is, in fact, something called the zodiacal dust cloud that is probably a remnant of the torrid meteor stream. Now, you've got all kinds of potential ways to alter conditions down here on the Earth. You can have the influx of, of a, one, of, one of the byproducts of a cometary disintegration actually may be asteroids or bodies that are so almost indistinguishable from asteroids. There may be things that go run the gamut of the range from, from dense iron objects all the way to middle range stony objects, all the way to snowball dense of objects. What about the dust? And then, yes, and then you could have the dust, the streams of dust. Now you might have the Earth encounter a stream of cosmic dust. There's never really an actual impact, but that cosmic dust could have profound consequences on the biosphere. Right. Well, for one thing, it could introduce material that could, could alter the trajectories of evolution itself by introducing material that could trigger genetic mutations. That's, that's, that's a theory that's been around for a long time and has recently received a lot more evidence in favor of it, that comets do contain the material that could alter a, nucle the, uh, a nucleotide template. And also, the dust itself could cause enormous climate changes. In fact, a very likely a uh, trigger for transition into an ice age could be an influx of cosmic dust that lasts long enough for the ice to, to get its grip. Because once the ice gets its grip, then that ice starts reflecting all the heat back to space. And it creates a set of mutually reinforcing feedback mechanisms. Because as the ice layer grows, it reflects that heat back into space that would normally be absorbed by the Earth and it causes the Earth to go even more cooler. See, that's one of the mysteries about ice ages is they, it seems like an ice age once commenced should be self-perpetuating forever, but they're not. Something causes the Earth to come out of those ice ages. It's almost like the dust could be more dangerous than the, the objects because if we use Star Wars against the objects, we could zap them, but the dust is, how do you, 
how do you protect against that? That would be, now see, there's a major technological... Uh, Big vacuum cleaner in the sky. Perhaps. Well, if in, 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 during the Ice Age, could the Earth move through a dust cloud, enough dust would collect on top of the ice to destroy that reflective situation? Well, I don't know, but an interesting... That, that one of the one of the ideas bandied about was if we started going into an, another ice age. This goes back in the 70s, when the fears were that we were perhaps headed for an ice age. Right, this was before the fears of global warming. They were saying, well, if we start going into another ice age, is there anything we could do to mitigate its effects? And that one, one of them was like spreading carbon dust, you know, on the ice to to change its albedo so that it absorbs heat rather than reflects heat and presumably melt the ice. And in fact, that can actually be seen when when volcanic dust or whatever something like that lands on ice and changes its albedo. It can change the whole dynamic of the glacier. It would require a lot of dust, but. But if we if we look at if we look at the um, the effects, for example, uh, at the end of the uh, like if we look at this image right here, let me pull up this image, and we've talked about LUS in here, haven't we?